Today we also talk about um, oxidative stress and antioxidants, which is quite a modern topic these days. And um, as you'll see maybe later on in pathology especially, you'll find out that quite a lot of diseases, especially degenerative diseases, are now considered to be at least partly caused by oxidative damage. So this topic, while even though we're going to be mostly talking about the, the physiology and the production and the, uh, the defense against oxidative stress, uh, you'll see later on that, that uh, the pathology is very important as well. Um, I am aware that from last time we didn't cover, I mean last time in the vitamins lecture we didn't cover B12 and folate. So if we have time at the end, I can talk a little bit about those two vitamins. Uh, if we don't have time, don't worry about it because you can easily find it in, in any textbook. So it's not, it's not a big deal. Okay, so the topic is oxidative stress. Why do we talk about oxidative stress? Why do we as humans or as animals or whatever, uh, why do we experience oxidative stress? What's, what's the reason? Very generally. Is there anything special about the Earth as opposed to other planets? There's oxygen. Exactly, there's oxygen in the, in the atmosphere. And that's something that's rather unusual. Many planets, uh, especially rocky planets, contain a lot of oxygen, but mostly it's bound in the rocks, so it's in the minerals. Here on Earth, we actually have loads and loads of oxygen in the air, which is, I mean, molecular oxygen in the air, which is quite unusual. And this causes, uh, the, this, this, this is the reason why we live in a highly oxidative environment, and this is the reason why we experience, or ourselves experience, oxidative stress. Um, what, what is the reason? Why do we have so much oxygen in the atmosphere? Why do we have so much oxygen in the atmosphere? Rakib, do you think you could either sit somewhere there or maybe here? Because there, there's a camera and your, ha your, hat, your head is going to be right in, in there. Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. So why, why do we have 20% oxygen in the, in the atmosphere? Why do we need it? Or why no, why do we have it? Why is it, why is it here? Oh. Okay, how? So my, microorganisms are producing it, but yeah? Through photosynthesis. So it's both microorganisms and plants that produce, uh, that produce oxygen. So before there was photosynthesis, the amount of oxygen in, in the atmosphere, in Earth's uh, atmosphere, was actually negligible. It was very little oxygen. But these days, we have about 20%, 20% oxygen. So all that oxygen in the atmosphere is the product of photosynthesis, or most of it is the product of photosynthesis, which is quite amazing, I think. Um, Okay, let's talk, let's talk about oxygen uh, from, a, from a chemical point of view. Uh, molecular oxygen is quite an interesting molecule. Uh, due to its electronic structure, molecular oxygen has two unpaired electrons. What does it mean? Do you know anything about unpaired electrons in, in molecules? Exactly. So, what are what are free radicals? If you just reactive species, I know. they're very reactive. Okay. So, free radicals in general are highly reactive molecules, and their the characteristic that makes them free radicals is the fact that they have unpaired electrons. You may recall from either high school chemistry or here from chemistry, most normal chemicals have all their electrons in their orbitals in their valence shell. They have paired. The electrons are paired with opposite spins. Okay, maybe some of you heard about that. Uh, free radicals are weird in that way that they have unpaired electrons. And these unpaired electrons are usually extremely reactive. Usually, but not always. Oxygen, dioxygen, molecular oxygen, is even stranger because it doesn't have just one unpaired electron, it has two unpaired electrons. Okay, so. We could draw it like this. Molecular oxygen has two unpaired electrons. Now you might ask, well, why don't they pair? 
uh, that's something that is quite complicated to explain, but basically the structure of the molecular orbital of the electrons in the molecule is such that this configuration with two unpaired electrons has the lowest energy. So under normal conditions, oxygen exists as a bi-radical. Okay, radical one electron unpaired, bi-radical two unpaired electrons. Okay, that makes oxygen a very, very strange, strange molecule. But when we talked about, when we talked about, when uh, the colleague mentioned um, that free radicals are usually extremely reactive, is oxygen very reactive? Is it a reactive element? What do you think? Hmm? To be so uh, reactive. Say again? If it was in a greater percentage, then it would be more uh, reactive. Okay, so if it were in a greater percentage, it would be more reactive than it is. That's true, but that's probably true for any, any element. But, so oxygen can be extremely reactive, but as you see under normal conditions, in normal, te normal temperature, normal pressure, it's actually not very reactive because thermodynamically speaking, if we are surrounded by 20% oxygen, we should all immediately burn. Because thermodynamically, it's favorable for oxygen to react with proteins, with, with fats, with anything. Okay, so thermodynamically, we should all, just by sitting in 20% oxygen, we should immediately burn. But for some reason, that's not what's, what's going on. And the reason for that is this strange electronic structure. So under, under this configuration with two unpaired electrons, oxygen does not really want to react with, for example, organic compounds. Because in order to react with the normal compound, so imagine that these two electrons look like this in the molecule. Okay, they are in different orbitals, but that's really not that important. Okay, so we have two electrons with the same spin. But normal compounds, have electrons like this. They're in one orbital and they have opposite spins. Now if we want to, want to have this react with that, the electrons can't form bonds because they are not appropriately, because one of them, I mean these two could form a bond, but these two cannot because they have the same spin. Okay, you don't have to remember that. This is just an illustration why oxygen in its, in its standard ground form is not a very reactive gas. Because there are spin constraints and kinetically the reaction is just unlikely. Even though thermodynamically it would be favorable. So if we looked at delta G of you know, our bodies burning in oxygen, the delta G is highly negative. It releases a lot of energy when it happens. But normally it just doesn't happen, as you can all see. And the reason for that is, that, that oxygen is a bi-radical, a very strange molecule. However, oxygen can be excited to a higher energy state where the two electrons pair. So if we heat oxygen, or if we uh, irradiate it with, with radiation, this ground state, also called triplet state, can be changed to an excited state called singlet state, singlet oxygen. Now this singlet oxygen has paired electrons and therefore is extremely reactive. This conversion of ground state oxygen to singlet oxygen is what we do when we strike a match and light a fire. So we need to heat oxygen up so that it becomes more reactive, and that's how we make it, how we make wood or paper burn. Okay, so it's the excitation from ground state to singlet state. So singlet oxygen is one of the reactive forms of oxygen, but we're actually not going to talk about it very much today, because in human physiology and pathology, singlet oxygen is not that important. It's kind of important, but not that important. So, you know from other, from other lectures that oxygen is needed in our body for various reactions. 
But now I just said that it doesn't actually want to react with anything. So how can we make oxygen, how do our cells make oxygen more reactive? One way of doing it is by reacting it, letting it react with other radicals. Okay? Oxygen is a biradical, so it will have difficulty reacting with normal chemicals that have paired electrons. But it can actually react reasonably well if we have a molecule that has unpaired electrons. Does it make sense? Does it make sense? Because the pairing of the electrons is actually, so these two, uh, I'm sorry, this electron is like this, these two can pair and we don't care about this one. So they can actually form a bond like that. Okay? So we can let oxygen react with other free radicals. Now, where in our body do we have stable radicals? Does anyone, could anyone guess? Metal. Hmm? Metal. Metal. Metals. Okay, why do you think the metals are free radicals? Excellent. So, transition metal ions. Transition metals such as zinc, copper, iron, molybdenum, manganese, all these metals, all these metals, they're metal ions, their electronic structure is such that they have unpaired electrons. So they actually behave like free radicals. Okay, so most notably, iron 2 plus, copper plus, manganese, and some other ones. You'll recall from our lectures on, on the electron transport chain that indeed, indeed, these metals are extremely important in the, in, the, uh, in the complexes in the electron transport chain because that's how we make oxygen react with the electrons that come through. So in, in cytochrome oxidase, in complex four, we have both copper and iron in heme that are necessary for oxygen to be actually reduced to water. Okay, so this is how we make oxygen more reactive in our body. So that's, that's how we make it reactive because we want it to be reactive. However, there are other possibilities for oxygen to become more reactive. And that is by reducing it, by adding more electrons to it. So oxygen itself, O2, not that reactive. But if we add one electron, what do we get? If we reduce it by one electron? Superoxide. Superoxide. This is superoxide, okay? Negative charge, still O2, but we lost one radical. We started with two unpaired electrons, now we lost one. Why, why did we lose one? Why did we lose one of the two unpaired electrons? Because of the reducing. Because? Can we reduce it? So we added one more electron, which paired with one of them, and only one is left, okay? In the beginning, I said that having two unpaired electrons is really awkward for reacting with anything. But having one, just one unpaired electron, that makes a molecule pretty reactive. So superoxide is the first product, the, the product of one electron reduction, and is, for, is, is one of the, the group of very reactive oxygen species. And actually, reactive oxygen species is the name, is the current name, for what used to be called free radicals or oxygen-derived free radicals. So reactive oxygen species. Is the name. And superoxide is one of them. It's basically the first step in the, in the reduction. Okay. What happens if we add another electron? to superoxide. What do we do? Hmm? 
Hm? Zeig mal gleich Reaktion. Now we are adding electrons. Okay. So we took molecular oxygen, we added one electron, now we're adding another electron. True, but what is the what is the product? Same. No, it's not. We started with this, and we're adding another electron. Yeah, so it's going to be O two two minus. What is that? Super duper oxide. No. If we react with two protons. Hydrogen peroxide. Yeah, well we just call it peroxide because it doesn't have to be hydrogen peroxide, but we call this molecule peroxide. So this is superoxide. Sorry, can you can you repeat that? If we, if we had an electron and it's yep. uh, say and it's opposite uh, spin, yep. would that attract the electron out of the oxygen molecule of the superoxide? Well, if you, I mean, as we did on the first, the first cell, the, the yeah, that's exactly what happens. So the second electron pairs with this unpaired electron. Is that your question? Uh huh. Okay. Yes. So therefore, peroxide, and that was something I was going to get to, peroxide is not a free radical. Uh, but if, if the electron has an opposite, uh, has the same spin? Well, if, if we have two molecules, and they both have electrons of the same spin, they won't react. So it will only react with a molecule that has the opposite spin, so that they can form a bond. Okay? But that's not a problem, because in a, in a mixture, in a gas or whatever, you have molecules with either that spin or that spin. The problem is here, because you have to have, basically in order for this to react, you would have to have a molecule that looks like this, or, or an orbital that looks like this. And you just can't find it. Okay? Because almost nothing has an electronic structure like this. That's why oxygen -like, looking like this can't react with, with normal things. Okay? But reacting just one electron is much, much easier. Okay? Because we only need basically one in the opposite direction, not two of them at the same time. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, again, just, just to reiterate, it's important to remember that peroxide is not a free radical. But it still is a reactive oxygen species because, because peroxide is still reactive and can do various things, but it's not a free radical. Okay? Right. What happens with peroxide if we add two more electrons? We could go step by step, we get a one and the second one, but I don't want to complicate things too much. Two hydrogen What? No. Just add the things together. Okay, so we could say that it becomes O2, 4 minus, in a way, but that's actually not what happens. What we get is, we get 2, O, 2 minus. And what is that? So it's superoxide, with peroxide, what is this? Hmm? Oxide. Exactly. Oxide. But for most of our reactions, actually what happens next is we again add four protons and we get two molecules of water. Okay? There is actually an intermediate step I kind of skipped one step by adding two electrons at the same time. But if we add just one electron to peroxide, we produce probably the most important molecule out of these reactive oxygen species, which looks like this. 
What is that? Huh? Hydroxyl? No, it's not hydroxide. Hydroxide would be OH minus. This is HO dot. It's called hy hydroxyl radical. Hydroxyl radical. And hydroxyl radical can be produced from hydrogen peroxide or from peroxide in the presence of iron or copper. So once again, the reactive oxygen species that we're going to be talking about today, apart from singlet oxygen, which we're not really going to mention again, are superoxide, peroxide, and hydroxyl radical. These are the important ones. Out of these, hydroxyl radical for the, for the damage, for the concept of oxidative stress, is by far the most important because it's by far the most reactive of all of these. Okay, so hydroxyl radical is many orders of magnitude more reactive than either superoxide or peroxide. Hydroxyl radical will react with anything that it encounters. So the first molecule that hydroxyl radical, that for example formed by this reaction, the first molecule that hydroxyl radical finds, it will react with immediately. It's extremely, extremely reactive. Okay. This also explains the, this scheme explains why iron, especially ferrous, ferrous ions and cuprous ions, are considered as pro-oxidants because they can change, they can convert hydrogen peroxide to hydroxyl radical, which is extremely, extremely reactive. Okay? So too much iron, too much copper can actually increase oxidative stress. They can be dangerous. That's also why our cells regulate the levels of free iron or free copper very tightly. They don't allow copper just being in the cytoplasm or just lying around because it, it would actually react with, with hydrogen peroxide and cause, cause these horrible things. Yep? Would this whole mechanism um, be affected by hemochromatosis? Of course, yeah. In hemochromatosis, in hemochromatosis, I don't know, do you all know what hemochromatosis is? Okay. What you, what you get is iron overload. So your tissues contain more iron than is normal. Now most of this iron is in inactive form, either in ferritin or in various crystals, etc., etc. But some of it is in this free reactive form. And indeed, a lot of damage, for example, to the liver in hemochromatosis is caused exactly by this reaction. Okay, by the production of hydroxyl radical by free iron. That's part of the reason why the liver uh, basically causes cirrhosis and other problems in hemochromatosis. Okay. Any questions about the, the chemistry of uh, reactive oxygen species? Mm -hmm. Kind of having a hard time picturing how the difference uh, in the electron shells would look between a hydroxide and a hydroxyl. Because one, is, one has a negative charge yeah. and one has an unfair electron. Okay. Yeah. Basically, you would need to add another another electron to hydroxyl radical in order to get hydroxide. Yeah, but if we have hydroxide, then, then it's balanced, right? Then they're all, all the electrons are paired. Yes. Um, okay. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, it's all good. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, uh, you can find either either on the internet or in, in some chemistry textbooks. You can actually find the molecular orbital of oxygen, and it makes it a little bit easier, maybe to to see how things actually pair together and how, how they form bonds. Yep. Uh, if hydroxyl radical is uh, so reactive, uh, then how can it how can it be contained inside the lysosome? How can it be contained inside the lysosome? I don't think it is. I don't think it is in the lysosome. Did I say that it was in the lysosome? No. Okay. No, no, no. It's hydroxyl radical is so reactive that it basically it disappears immediately. Okay. After it's produced, it just disappears. So 
while, for example, superoxide hydrogen peroxide can be actually used by our, our cells to do things, and we're going to talk about it in a minute, hydroxyl radical is so reactive, it's just damaging. It, you can't regulate it, you can't contain it. There's nothing you can do. Okay? There are no enzymes that interact with it. It's just so reactive, it will react with anything. Okay. Okay, no more questions? Is it all clear? Okay. Uh, now let's talk about what these radicals can do in our cells. So how do these reactive oxygen species, how do they cause damage? Actually, before we start that, before we start talking about that, I'll just mention another abbreviation, and that's reactive nitrogen species. Reactive nitrogen species are free, free radicals and other reactive compounds containing nitrogen. Okay, so reactive oxygen species are just with oxygen. Reactive nitrogen species contain nitrogen. The, the source of reactive nitrogen species is nitric oxide. Okay, nitric oxide itself a free radical can react with superoxide and can form a very strange compound which looks like this. Could anyone maybe try and name this compound? Deoxonitrate oxide. No, it's called peroxynitrite. So if you take away one oxygen, it's nitrite. NO2 minus. Yeah. But there's one more oxygen there, so it's called peroxynitrite. And peroxynitrite is another very reactive molecule. And these days, people actually think that peroxynitrite and its further breakdown products, because it can, it can cause the production of hydroxyl radicals as well, that these are actually very important in, in pathology, in, in causing damage to cells. Okay, so just so you know, there are reactive nitrogen species related to nitric oxide. And uh, peroxynitrite is considered RNS or RNS? It's considered? It's RNS, it's RNS. It contains nitrogen, it's a reactive nitrogen species. Okay. Good. Let's now talk about the damage. What do these, uh, these reactive species, what do they do to our cells? So if we look at the main chemical components of the cell, we have lipids, proteins, nucleic acids, basically. Talking about the organic, uh, organic uh, components. Lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. All these three groups can be and are damaged by uh, reactive oxygen species and reactive nitrogen species. So let's talk about the individual groups and the specific mechanisms, mechanisms of damage. Um, let's start from the bottom, so let's start with nucleic acids. Uh, nucleic acids can be damaged by reactive, reactive oxygen species in two ways. Either the, the reactive oxygen species, the molecule, can react with the base, or it can react with the sugar. If, for example, hydroxyl radical, which is the most reactive, reacts with the base, it modifies the base. It modifies the nucleotide. So, for example, you can get a hydroxyl group appearing on the base where normally there is none. Okay? So hydroxyl radical just binds to the base and adds a hydroxyl group. This sometimes doesn't do very much or the cell just gets rid of the, uh, of the modified base. But sometimes this can lead to mutation because the modified base 
in the in the pairing in in for example replication it, it behaves like a different base than it than it normally is does it make sense yeah so the modification of a base can lead to mutation the mutation can potentially lead for example to to cancer formation to carcinogenesis if the hydroxyl radical or any other reactive oxygen species reacts with the sugar what are the sugars in nucleic acids? Ribose or deoxyribose. So if it reacts with ribose or deoxyribose, it can cause a strand break. So the whole strand is broken. Now again, you know from molecular biology that cells can, our cells can quite easily repair these breaks. But sometimes in the repair, mistakes are made. Okay? And therefore, even strand breaks can lead to recombination, to chromosome damage, or even mutation. So, thiol groups are part of cysteine residues in proteins. And these thiol groups can be quite easily oxidized by reactive oxygen species. The oxidation can have several different forms. One of the, the possible results of oxidation of thiol groups is a reaction with another thiol group and the formation of a disulfide bridge. Or, well, the disulfide anyway. Okay, you've seen this in molecular biology that disulfide bridges are an important, are an important structural component of proteins. But in this case, these disulfides are produced between cysteines that normally should not produce a disulfide bridge. Okay? So in proteins, you have structural disulfide bridges. But if a, if a protein is oxidized, if it's damaged by reactive oxygen species, these disulfides are formed elsewhere in the protein. And that causes a damage that causes changes in the protein, protein structure and therefore in protein function. If the oxidative uh, stimulus is strong enough, the SH group can even be oxidized to various acids derived from sulfur. Okay? Sulfenic, sulfenic, and sulfonic acids. You don't have to, you don't have to know that. While the formation of disulfides is, can be repaired, so these disulfides can be reduced back to SH groups. Once the, once the sulfur is oxidized like this, it's basically, it basically can't be repaired, and therefore these proteins have to, be, have to be destroyed and have to be made again. Other parts of proteins, other amino acids, can also be damaged by, uh, uh, by reactive oxygen species in many different ways. Uh, but I'm not going to go into, into the specific details. The one I would like you to remember is that SH groups can be quite easily, easily oxidized. Okay? Any questions? No? If not, we're going to have a look at lipids, because that's the group that's probably most interesting and most susceptible uh, to oxidation. The type of lipids that most, that's most susceptible to oxidation is what? Do you know? Which lipids are easily oxidized? Uh, yes, maybe. But specifically, what kind of... Well, actually it's unsaturated. Okay, unsaturated and specifically polyunsaturated fatty acids are the most susceptible. So cholesterol, any saturated, is a, any saturated lipids are actually, you can't oxidize them or it's very difficult to oxidize them. But the unsaturated, especially polyunsaturated, are susceptible. I'm going to show you how that works. So this is a part of a chain of, an poly, of a polyunsaturated fatty acid. Do you understand how it works? Okay, the fatty acid will just go on and on and on, but we're just looking at the middle where there are two double bonds. Okay, so this is a, this is a part of a polyunsaturated fatty acid with two double bonds. Okay, you will recall from 
previous lectures that normal or you know in our body normal fatty acids nor normal polyunsaturated fatty acids have always cis configuration of the double bond yeah and they are normally not conjugated so they are normally not next to each other but there's one intervening carbon atom between them yeah that's just the general structure of fatty acids okay <clears throat> this carbon atom between the two double bonds obviously has two hydrogen atoms nothing interesting there but these two hydrogen atoms are actually very sensitive to oxidation they can be quite easily removed for reasons that I can explain later on if you're interested in okay so it's the carbon atom between two double bonds that's specifically susceptible to reaction with with free radicals okay so what happens let's react this fatty acid let's say it's in a membrane okay fatty acid in a membrane let's react it with hydroxyl radical this highly reactive uh, oxygen species what happens the hydroxyl radical basically wants to become water so it will take this one hydrogen hydrogen and make water but what is what is left from the fatty acid it becomes the radical itself okay so hydroxyl radical comes takes away h dot basically okay so it takes so this becomes h dot the two react they form water but what we are left with is a fatty acid is a radical derived from a fatty acid okay can you see that so that's the first step in the damage but as we said in the beginning free radicals are generally pretty reactive so this will not just sit there this this radical derived from fatty acid will not just sit there but it will start reacting with other things and one of the things it can react with is oxygen if the radical derived from fatty acid reacts with oxygen it forms something like this which is called a peroxyl radical okay, you don't necessarily have to remember all the all the nomenclature but just kind of the general gist of it the peroxyl radical again being fairly reactive can do a very interesting thing it can itself react with another molecule of fatty acid remember we're talking about a fatty acid that sits in the membrane okay so in the membrane we have one chain of fatty acid next to each other so they're very very close to each other so if one of them becomes a peroxyl radical it can react with the neighboring unsaturated fatty acid so imagine that that's what happens so we take another uh, fatty acid the original fatty acid or the peroxyl radical will once again strip a hydrogen and what we get is another radical derived from fatty acid yep exactly it does lead to a domino like cascade we call it a chain reaction because from one and you'll see it actually continues even further from one damaged fatty acid from one hydroxyl radical we can get tens or hundreds of damaged fatty acids by this mechanism because you can see that it, it just keeps amplifying itself so the, we can basically go back here and we get another branch which can another, not react with another fatty acid and can react with another fatty acid okay so this is a chain reaction but we're not finished yet because what can happen with this peroxide so we have peroxyl radical this is peroxide this peroxide can react with iron by the same reaction as we saw before and what we can get is another radical because this peroxide is not a radical anymore 
Okay, peroxide, recall, peroxides are not radicals. But can react with iron, and we can form a radical like that. It's called alkoxyl radical. And this radical can react with another fatty acid and can form another fatty acid radical. This thing becomes hydroxyl group. That's that. So this is stable. This will not react with anything else. But we get we got another radical that just amplifies the whole reaction. Okay, so this is a chain reaction of fatty acid oxidation by free, free, free radicals. That's why I said that lipids are extremely susceptible to damage because they can propagate, this damage can propagate through the whole membrane, it can damage it quite a bit. If this is the end product of oxidation, you can see, or you can, when you think about it, it is actually a pretty big problem to have a hydroxyl group in the middle of a fatty acid. Okay? Remember that in the membrane, these are the fatty acids, okay, like that, in the, in the, uh, in the bilayer. And all this, this whole environment, is very hydrophobic, okay? These are just carbon, carbon, carbon chains, basically. But if suddenly we get a hydroxyl group there, the whole thing becomes much less hydrophobic and the membrane can't actually do its function. Okay, because imagine that suddenly we have an OH group here and an OH group here. Therefore, molecules of water can get in and all sorts of things start happening. So by this process, the, the membrane is damaged and needs to be repaired, it needs to be actually re remade. Okay, so that's, that's the, uh, the cascade, the chain reaction of fatty acid oxidation, yeah? Uh, would I use it as a treatment method for tumors? The problem with tumors is that any treatment method that you use needs to be specific to the tumor. So causing this oxidation in our cells is very easy. We can just you know, inject some initiators of, of, of damage. The problem is targeting it only to a tumor and not to the healthy tissues. So causing this artificially is very easy. But how to make sure that it only happens in the tumor, that's the difficult bit. So basically, no, this is not used. I mean, it is actually used because there are some of the, some of the cancer treatments cause this oxidative damage. Uh, so some drugs can actually cause this damage, but it's, it's, um, it's not necessarily the, the, the main reason why we, why, why we use these drugs. Okay. You, you'll see later on in pharmacology, uh, that some drugs have these side effects. Okay, so let's uh, let's continue with the with the lecture. Do you have any more questions about uh, the chemistry of, of oxidative damage? Uh, does it only affect the structures of uh, our body or also the nutrition? Um, it does affect nutrients as well. Uh, for example, this peroxidation, this lipid peroxidation cascade, occurs when you're frying things. So when you fry things, you heat the oils, and especially vegetable oils contain a lot of polyunsaturated fatty acids. So as you heat them up, and there's plenty of oxygen around, some of these reactions will occur as well. So that's the reason why basically, you know, oils, after you've fried in them, they change color, they start to smell, sometimes they smoke, and that those are the results of these reactions. Because what happens in the end, sometimes you just get a fatty acid with a hydroxyl group, but actually the fatty acids can break into smaller bits. Uh, for example, into malondialdehyde, into weird reactive aldehydes and things like that. So, so yes, you can, it, it can absolutely happen in, in, the, in the diet by basically cooking, frying, doing things with, thing, with, 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 with food. We can get these reactions as well. And part of the re I mean, part of the, the f part of the fact that we like cooked food or fried food or, or you know, uh, roasted meat or something are these reactions because that that 
the tasty things and the, the, the things that smell nicely are actually products of these reactions. So, you know, you could just cook everything in water and it would be bland and there would be no such reactions that are all going on. But kind of part of the fun of making good food is actually these reactions. All right, there are no more questions. We're going to move on to the, the sources of reactive oxygen species, and then we're going to talk about the defenses that we have. So reactive oxygen species in our body can originate, quite obviously, either from the outside or from the inside. Uh, from the, the outside sources, the external sources of reactive oxygen species, does anyone know what they are? External sources? Is there anything in the environment that can cause uh, the production of reaction, uh, reactive oxygen species? Maybe from biophysics? Radiation, radiation. absolutely. Ionizing radiation. is a very important source for reactive oxygen species. Uh, obviously, normally, we are exposed to relatively low levels of radiation, but we are exposed to radiation all the time, as you, as you probably know. Where, where is this radiation coming from that we're exposed to all the time? I mean, ra uh, ionizing radiation. Yeah, where, where, where is background radiation coming from? What, what are the sources of background radiation? Depends on where in the world you are. I guess. Like in Norway, it's a lot of radon. Okay, so something is coming from the ground because of radioactive, uh, radioactive dis disintegration of, of whatever, radioactive. But there are other sources as well. So something's coming from the ground and a bit is coming from the universe. Cosmic radiation, yeah? So anyway, we're, we're always exposed to, to some ionizing radiation. Ionizing radiation, actually does an interesting thing. It produces reactive oxygen species, species by an interesting mechanism. Because ionizing radiation has enough energy to break the bond between hydrogen and oxygen in water, and it can directly produce two radicals from it. So for example, gamma, gamma radiation and some more powerful X-rays can cause this, this damage. So a molecule of water is split into two radicals. And we said before that hydroxyl radical and even the hydrogen radical are very reactive. So they can then cause all these various things. Okay? So that's a big, big part of why ionizing radiation is, is, is damaging these reactions. Apart from ionizing radiation, uh, another type of photons can cause oxidative damage, and that's UV radiation ultraviolet rays. There, the, 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 uh, the mechanism of production of, of free radicals is a bit more complicated because UV rays, UV photons, don't have enough energy to actually cause this reaction. So they first need to be absorbed by some chemical, and then this chemical becomes excited and can, can, can actually create uh, free radicals. I'm not going to go into details, but, but UV light can also produce, uh, produce reactive oxygen species. And finally, when we talk about environmental sources of, of, free, of, of reactive oxygen species, uh, general pollution, uh, car exhaust fumes, uh, fumes from various factories can contain reactive chemicals that can give rise to reactive oxygen species in our lungs and elsewhere in the body. So generally pollution and radiation can be sources, smoking can be a source of, of, of uh, reactive oxygen species. Much more interesting, however, at least from our point of view, are the intrinsic, the internal sources of free of uh, reactive oxygen species. Does anyone know where in our body or what can produce in our body uh, reactive oxygen species? Macrophages. Okay, how do macrophages produce it? Or as a part of what? As a part of killing the bacteria. Okay, so you've all heard in immunology about oxidative burst of phagocytes. So it's both neutrophils and macrophages can, cause it, uh, can, can, can go through it as well. The oxidative burst is basically just 
a production, a massive production of reactive oxygen species, of hydrogen peroxide, hypochloride, all sorts of, of, of very reactive uh, species. And hydroxyl radical is produced in, uh, as a part of that as well. Okay. So in inflammation, in order to kill bacteria or parasites, our body, our cells can produce hydrogen peroxide and other very reactive uh, components. Okay? So that's one source of normal, intrinsic source of, of uh, reactive oxygen species. Any other ones? Another very important source and a major source of reactive, reactive oxygen species that's active all the time is the electron transport chain. Mitochondrial electron transport chain. In the electron transport chain, it's especially complex one and complex three that produce superoxide. Interestingly, it's not complex four. What is complex four? What is complex four in the electron transport chain? Is there another? Okay, it's the one that reduces oxygen to water. But what is what is the name of the complex? Okay, it's cytochrome oxidase. Cytochrome oxidase, but correctly. That's the one, complex four is the one where oxygen comes in and is reduced to water. Interestingly, complex four does not release any reactive oxygen species. And that's the only complex that actually does anything with, with oxygen. But it doesn't seem to produce any reactive oxygen species. But complex one and complex three that just transport electrons from one bit to another bit, they can, under certain conditions, give these electrons directly to oxygen and form superoxide. Okay, so complex one, complex three can, can produce it. Uh, that is actually a quite a substantial, uh, I mean, quite a substantial amount of superoxide is produced in our mitochondria all the time. There are various estimates, some estimates say that even, that as much as 1% of all electrons ends up as superoxide. So 99% of electrons go all the way to water, but 1%, which is huge, that's a huge amount, 1% can go to superoxide, okay? Some people disagree with that, but anyway, it's, it's one, one estimate. Uh, which, is, which is fairly high, I think. So, macrophages in inflammation and electron transport chain all the time produce these, these radicals, uh, specifically superoxide uh, in this case. That's one of the reasons why our body developed defenses, or our body, I mean, animals and, and microorganisms develop defenses against these, uh, these reactive oxygen species so that they can protect their membranes and DNA and proteins from the damage. Now, these defenses exist in two main groups. So now we're going to be talking about antioxidants, basically. The two main groups that I want to talk about are the first group are antioxidant enzymes. So enzymes that do something with these reactive oxygen species. The other group are going to be small molecule antioxidants. Okay. Enzymes. The most of, one of the most important enzymes that deals with reactive oxygen species is an enzyme called superoxide dismutase. Have you heard of superoxide dismutase before? Yeah? What did you hear about it? It takes superoxide and uh, makes water. Excellent. So, well, it doesn't really make water, but anyway. Uh, so, superoxide dismutase. The name of the enzyme kind of tells us what kind of reaction we are to expect, what kind of, uh, what kind of reaction the, the enzyme catalyzes. It's called dismutation. What is dismutation? Does anyone know? Dismutation generally in chemistry is a reaction where you take two molecules of the same chemical 
You react one with the other one. And in that, you reduce one of them and oxidize the other one. So you take two molecules and basically you move one electron from one of them to the other one. Or more electrons. But does it make sense? I'm going to show it with, with superoxide in a minute. So this mutation is a reaction of two molecules of the same thing in which one of them is reduced and the other one is oxidized. So it's a redox reaction between two molecules of the same thing. So we have two molecules of superoxide and we need to reduce one of them and oxidize the other one. So what are going to be the products? Two molecules of superoxide. One of them is going to be reduced, the other one is going to be oxidized. Like you one oxide. Huh? One oxide. Excellent. So we have one molecule of oxygen and one molecule of. What is that thing? Oxygen. No, it's not. Peroxide. Okay? So I've just added two protons. So we get hydrogen peroxide. Okay? One molecule was oxidized into oxygen, and the other one was reduced into hydrogen peroxide. Make sense? Yeah, that's this mutation of superoxide. What I find quite important when looking at this, at this, at this equation is that even though superoxide, superoxide dismutase is an antioxidant enzyme, it still produces a reactive oxygen species, which is hydrogen peroxide. So that's something I think that's worth remembering because in, experiment, in experiments, people sometimes would add superoxide dismutase and would say, therefore, we got rid of any oxidative stress because superoxide dismutase is obviously an antioxidant enzyme. But in fact, what you do when you add superoxide dismutase, you get rid of superoxide, but you produce hydrogen peroxide. And hydrogen peroxide, as you'll recall, can produce which molecule? Which reactive oxygen species can we get from? Hydrogen peroxide itself is not very reactive, but it can produce which reactive molecule? Hmm? Hydroxyl. Hydroxyl radical, exactly. So by getting rid of superoxide, which is fairly reactive, but not that reactive, you produce hydrogen peroxide that can cause the production of hydroxyl radical, which is hugely massively reactive, okay? So just something to, to remember. Superoxide dismutase, yes, it is an antioxidant enzyme. It gets rid of superoxide, but it produces hydrogen peroxide. Uh, there are two types of superoxide dismutase, and they both contain metal ions. Uh, there is a reason why they contain metal ions, because superoxide itself is negatively charged. So reacting two molecules of superoxide together would be very difficult, because they each have a negative charge. So getting them together to react would be very, very difficult. So what happens in these enzymes is that one molecule reacts with a metal ion, it gives its its electron to it. And then another molecule of superoxide reacts with the, with the reduced ion and, 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 and becomes reduced itself. Okay? Anyway, the two types of superoxide dismutase are copper zinc. So one of them contains copper and zinc. And that's the kind of superoxide dismutase that's present in the cytoplasm. The other kind of superoxide dismutase contains manganese, and that's the mitochondrial enzyme. Okay, and obviously we need quite a lot of mitochondrial superoxide dismutase because we just mentioned a second ago that quite a lot of superoxide is produced from complex one and complex three. Okay, so that's superoxide dismutase. By that, we produce hydrogen peroxide, so now we need some enzymes that will, get rid of, that will get rid of hydrogen peroxide. These enzymes are called peroxidases. 
and peroxidases, get rid of peroxides, including hydrogen peroxide, yes? Catalase is one of peroxidases, and I'm going to, I'm going to mention it just, just in a second. The general reaction of peroxidases is as follows. So we take hydrogen peroxide, we take two reducing equivalents, two electrons basically, and we make two molecules of water. Okay, recall in the beginning when I showed you all the reactions, that we can add two electrons to hydrogen peroxide and we can make water. Yeah. So this is what peroxidases in general do. Take hydrogen peroxide, take some donor of electrons and make water. Water is obviously stable, no, it's not reactive or anything. So by these two reactions we basically got rid of any dangerous things. Now where do we get these reducing equivalents, where do we get these electrons from? One possible way is to use glutathione. So. Glutathione. You've heard of glutathione before? The abbreviation usually is GSH. And we need to use for the enzyme called glutathione pero peroxidase, we need to use two molecules of GSH as reducing agents. Okay. What we get from it is GSSG, so we get a dimer. The two glutathione molecules actually react with each other. Okay. That's the disulfide bridge that I talked about. In, the, in oxidizing proteins. So you basically do the same thing. Here you take GSH, two SH groups, you oxidize them in order to reduce hydrogen peroxide to water, and you make GSSG. Does this make sense? Sort of, not really. Okay. So this, is, this enzyme is called glutathione peroxidase. And one thing that I want you to remember about glutathione peroxidase is that it contains a very special trace element, and that's selenium. Okay, so glutathione peroxidase contains selenium in the, in the form of selenocysteine. So it looks like cysteine, but instead of sulfur, it has selenium. Okay, that's glutathione peroxidase. But Rahib, you mentioned another important peroxidase called catalase. And catalase is very interesting because it uses, as the donor of, of, of electrons, it uses another molecule of hydrogen peroxide. So it takes hydrogen peroxide, It reduces it to water, but this hydrogen peroxide becomes oxygen. Okay, there are obviously two waters, two oxygens. Is that right? Sorry, no, it's just one oxygen. Does it make sense? So here we took glutathione, reduced glutathione, and we oxidized it to oxidize glutathione. Just nod your head or shake your head if you don't follow. Okay? Here we took hydrogen peroxide and we oxidized it to oxygen. Okay? And this hydrogen peroxide was reduced to water. In effect, what catalase does, it dismutates hydrogen peroxide. So catalase is basically hydrogen peroxide dismutase, only it's not called that. Yeah? Does it make sense? What happens there? Okay. So these are the, the most important uh, antioxidant enzymes. There are many other ones, but these are the ones I would like you to remember. Superoxide dismutase, glutathione peroxidase, and catalase. 
Okay? Now, let's talk about these. Do you have any questions about the antioxidant, antioxidant enzymes? Um, how do we return them? Because obviously if we have a lot of the hydrogen peroxide, we get a lot of the GSSG. Yeah. There is an enzyme called glutathione reductase. Reductase, which uses NADPH. It's NADP plus. And reduces oxidized glutathione. This is the reason, this specifically is the reason why we need NADPH, why people say that NADPH is necessary for protecting, for example, pr protecting membrane in eryth erythrocytes. Okay? Do, do you remember that? In erythrocytes, the pentose phosphate pathway is there to produce NADPH to protect the membrane from oxidative damage. And that's the reason. Because we need glutathione peroxidase to get rid of hydrogen peroxide, but in order to do that, we need to be able to reduce glutathione um, oxidized glutathione to reduce glutathione. For that, we need NADPH. Okay, glutathione reductase. Any other questions? So, this is how we get rid of the, let's say, the less reactive reactive oxygen species. Superoxide, hydrogen peroxide. They are reactive, but not that reactive. But as I said in the beginning, hydroxyl radical is so reactive that we can't use any enzyme to do something with it because it will just react with everything. So we can't actually have an enzyme. That's part of the reason why we have small molecule antioxidants that will react, for example, with hydrogen peroxide, with, with hydroxyl radical and will detoxify it. I'm just gonna show you how they do it. Antioxidants. The general principle by which small molecule antioxidants work is that you take an antioxidant, you react it with a radical, you give the radical the hydrogen that it wants, Again, remember when we talk about fatty acids that, for example, hydroxyl radical will take a hyd hydrogen from a molecule and will make another radical. Like that. Okay? Antioxidant plus radical equals detoxifying radical, for example, water or what have you, and a radical derived from the antioxidant. Okay? That's a general reaction that would be true for fatty acid or anything else. The specific thing that makes an antioxidant an antioxidant is that this radical is unreactive. It doesn't want to react with anything. So the radical is pretty much stable. It just sits there and doesn't really do very much. Okay. Okay, so this is the principle through which basically most antioxidants work. They react with a very reactive radical, for example, hydroxyl radical. They make water and a very poorly reactive antioxidant radical. Do you understand how that protects the body from, from radicals? So we didn't get rid of the radical. It's, we still have the unpaired electron but it doesn't do any damage because the, the antioxidant radical will not react with fatty acids, it will not react with, with nu nucleic acids, it's just poorly reactive. Okay? Do you understand that? Sort of? Yeah? Good. Now, the obvious question is, how come that the antioxidant r radicals are so poorly reactive? In general, it's because the unpaired electron is delocalized in the molecule. What does it mean delocalized? Doesn't have a specific location. 
Yeah, that's true. It doesn't have a specific location. But what does it mean in chemistry? Um, so, if we look at benzene, you all know that benzene doesn't look like this, but actually the electrons are kind of all over the place. Okay, they just kind of hover above and below the the ring. Okay, so if imagine so imagine that you have a molecule like this, and you make it a free radical like that. So this radical can either be here, the unpaired electron, or here. There are just two possibilities where the radical electron can be. But in a benzene ring, when there is a delocalized uh, system of pi bonds, the radical can be here, or here, or here, or here, or here. It's basically, the radical is just kind of somewhere there. It can be in many different places. And that makes it a lot more stable. Okay. So delocalization of the unpaired electron is the mechanism by which antioxidants become basically an unreactive radical. And in order to do that, they generally need to have a system of conjugated double bonds, as long as possible, as big as possible. So the more conjugated double bonds, the more stable the resulting radical is, because the radical can be anywhere else. Make sense? So pretty much all the antioxidants, all the effective antioxidants, have systems of conjugated double bonds that stabilize the radical. Uh, yeah? But isn't it, a, uh, isn't it logical that if you have an electron which moves throughout the whole molecule every time, it would be more unstable? I'm not sure if that's logical, but that's not the case. Actually, the more you delocalize it, the more stable it is. The same way as Benzene is a very stable molecule because the electrons are delocalized. Because if you have like the one benzene, yep. would that at one point be all the electrons at one uh, single point of the benzene molecule, making it very stable? Yeah, but it's, it's highly unlikely that they would all be in the same place. Yeah, but uh, it's highly unlikely, but if, it's, uh, if the electrons are not moving, the possibility is not. Well, that's not true, because, okay, that's, that's slightly off topic, but if you have a compound like this, okay, you have six pi electrons in this case, okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, okay, so you always know that one electron is here, one is always 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 here, okay, but if you do localize them, then they are all basically around the whole nucleus. So the probability that even, even one is going to be right here is actually lower because, because they're all over the place. They're just moving around the place. Okay. But it's actually, I mean, these are all just kind of techniques how to illustrate this thing. But the real way to figure out how, the, how these things work is actually by looking at the quantum mechanics of it. Because the resulting orbital from all the p orbitals above and that is is more stable because of quantum mechanic uh, quantum mechanic reasons. So this is just kind of to illustrate things. But yeah, you would have really have to go into into the, uh, the quantum mechanics. Sorry. So anyway, uh, let's now talk about the specific specific antioxidants. We only have about two minutes left. Uh, they are there. We have lipophilic and hydrophilic antioxidants, the same way as with vitamins. The lipophilic uh, antioxidants predominantly exist in membranes and protect membranes, obviously, because they can't dissolve in cytoplasm. And the hydrophilic ones generally cytoplasm or they play around with the, with the lipid ones. The lipophilic antioxidants, what is the most important lipophilic antioxidant? Maybe. You might have heard about it. It's vitamin E. Okay, vitamin E or tocopherol is a very important antioxidant in our membranes, especially in the, the cytoplasmic mem uh, membrane. Okay, I'm not going to go into, into details about its structure, but it looks something like this. OK, 
okay? And can form a radical like that, and this radical is basically delocalized around this whole structure and that makes it relatively stable. Okay, so that's vitamin E. The other important and very, in a way, similar antioxidant that people don't mention very often, or well, some people do, is coenzyme Q or ubiquinol. Where, where is that? Where is coenzyme Q? In the respiratory chain. What does it do there? Transfers electrons between complex one, complex two, and complex three, basically. So this is what ubiquinol looks like in a way. And you can see that it basically looks very similar to vitamin E. If you take this bit of vitamin E and you move it like that, it's very similar. And it actually works as an antioxidant. It works very similarly. So it can form, by this reaction, it can form a free radical, which is all, again, stabilized by delocalization around the ring. So this radical called ubisemiquinone, it's a semiquinone, is stabilized. And coenzyme Q is by far the most important antioxidant in the mitochondrial inner membrane. So the concentration of CoQ is very high. It's in the order of 10 to 20 millimolar, very, very high concentration of CoQ. So in the mitochondrial inner membrane, where, as we saw before, a lot of superoxide is produced, because there's the electron transport chain, the most important antioxidant there is coenzyme Q, is ubiquinol. Okay. As for the hydrophilic, I'm gonna just mention beta carotene as the lipophilic, another lipophilic one. But I'm just gonna put it in brackets because it's not quite sure that actually in our body, that beta carotene is an important antioxidant, but maybe it is. Uh, just last few things, hydrophilic. What is the most important hydrophilic antioxidant in our cells? Vitamin C. Vitamin C. I mean, I, I'm just gonna put glutathione there as well, but let's put ascorbic acid. Okay, this is what ascorbic acid looks like. And again, it works the same way as all the other ones. So it can form, it can react with a free radical. It can form its own radical. And this radical is stabilized by this system of conjugated double bonds. Okay? Uh, last thing I'm gonna say, vitamin E and vitamin C interact with each other. So once this radical is formed from tocopherol in the membrane, it can react with vitamin C in the cytoplasm and regenerate itself. So vitamin C can regenerate vitamin E in the membranes. So there's an interplay between the two. Okay, any questions? No questions? Too much chemistry? Questions? No? No? Okay. Well, that's all.